All right, folks, welcome to another edition of Millennials Are Killing Capitalism Live. Before we get started, I just want to do a shout out real quick to In The Mix Prisoner Podcast, which became a YouTube member. Shout out to them. If you don't follow their work or support their work, please do. Uh, it's a podcast run by prisoners in, um, I think, predominantly in Pennsylvania, but perhaps also expanding out to other places as well. Um, we've had Safir, who helps to coordinate it on the the audio podcast of ours. So anyway, shout out to them. Um, and thanks for the support. And the other thing I want to say up front is that if folks are able on Friday, we are going to have we have an amazing show on Friday. We have a panel tribute birthday celebration for Quasi Balagoon. Um, it would be his 77th birthday if he hadn't um, if we hadn't lost him back in 1986 to complications with AIDS. Um, and that uh, the panel that we have for that is, I think, the most amazing panel that I've ever seen or been a part of. Um, it includes David Gilbert. It might be David Gilbert's first public interview since he was released. I'm not positive on that. Maybe he's done a couple of other things, but certainly one of his first. Um, it includes Ashanti Alston, and then it includes Matt Meyer, Meg Starr, uh, Dequi, Keone Siddiqui, um, and uh, uh, Bilal Suni Ali also is a part of that. So definitely come through and check that out. We will be debuting that and I'll be live with folks to, you know, talk in the chat and stuff like that. And um, yeah, I really look forward to that. Um, I also look forward to this. Today, we are joined again by Abdul Jawad Omar. Um, we're going to talk about his late, well, I don't know if it's his latest. He'll always correct me because every time I have him on, I say it's his latest piece. And he's like, oh, no, I've written something else that's out. So, um, but this is a piece called Crosshairs that showed up in a publication called Rusted and Rusted Radishes or Rusted and Radishes, rustedradishes.com. Um, the link is in the show notes. Very interesting piece um, and look forward to talking to Abdul Jawad again today about this. So um, Abdul Jawad, thank you for, for joining us again. Um, for folks who don't know, uh, Abdul Jawad is a, a writer, analyst and lecturer based in Ramallah, Palestine. He currently lectures in the Department of Philosophy and Cultural Studies at Berzit University. Um, so thanks again for joining us. I mean, thank you for having me, Jared. Uh, I'm glad to be again uh, with you. Absolutely. I look forward to these these talks. It's a part of, part of my, you know, semi-weekly therapy or something. But um, uh, anyway, uh, thanks again for, for coming on. And um, so this piece, you know, it starts off with you kind of recounting this the story of your own experiences, um, you know, being shot by a sniper. Uh, needless to say, like most of us in the United States, we, you know, unless folks have been a part of, you know, military or something like that, right? They, they wouldn't have any experience with something like this. Um, obviously, we have our own protest movements. And in, interestingly, there's been exchange historically between Palestinians and um folks in the United States on, you know, how to deal with tear gas and how to deal with, you know, rubber bullets and things like that. Um, and certainly, you know, gun violence is because of the settler context here. It's also, uh, you know, there's a ton of that. So people have plenty of experience with with guns and gunshots, probably. But, you know, being targeted by a sniper is a kind of different experience. And you recount some of the aspects of this in your article. Um, uh so you know and, and you kind of you're working through i would say sort of a paradigm of uh palestinians as targets um so maybe you could just start with that experience that you share and kind of how that helped shape your understanding i mean it, it was interesting to me um since the beginning of the war but perhaps historically speaking as well that whenever you look at israeli propaganda accounts including like their uh um, official, um, you know, IDF accounts or um, that the notion that they're targeting Hamas targets in the Gaza Strip, you know, we've targeted 20,000 targets or 30,000 targets. And then we, on the other flip side of it, we see 
the deaths of whole uh, and the destruction of buildings, families, etc. And this notion of being a target, what does it entail? You know, the target is a very, you know, uh, desensitized image of what you're actually uh, doing in terms of, uh, you know, unleashing your killing machine on the Gaza Strip. It's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's an image that makes you feel at ease, specifically if you support Israel. That you know, these are all military targets. They're logical. Um, they're part of a military logic and a military planning that goes into. Um, you know, uh, winning this war and coming out triumphant. So for me, at least, I mean, um, you know, historically speaking, it's also it echoes to a lot of different, you know, colonial campaigns and imperial wars. Um, the idea that, for instance, Palestinians die but are not killed while, you know, Israelis were killed and massacred by Hamas. You know, this emphasis always in the news around... Um, um, Placing the perpetuator of the attacks on the 7th of October being Hamas, Palestinian fighters, etc. While at the same time, we have this very intensive campaign of killing that um, as if it comes out of nowhere, you know, as if, you know, people are dying in the Gaza Strip, but nobody's really killing them if it's, as if it's a natural catastrophe or an earthquake or something along those lines. And I think for, for me in a... And I can speak for a lot of Palestinians here is that this um, there's always that moment in your life where you, you know, um, kind of feel that you could easily be killed without, you know, um, respite or remorse or uh, justice being done um, multiple, you know, throughout our own history and um, it's very bloody, um, um, you know, uh, chronology, if you want. That, that has always been the case, but also on, in terms of our everyday life. Meaning that, you know, you, you, can, you, you have countless stories of people, for instance, being stopped at a checkpoint and for no reason, for instance, being humiliated and then taken apart or uh, left on the side of the road uh, for two hours or three hours, um, tied down or beaten up by Israeli soldiers. Um, while these Israeli soldiers are laughing or making fun of them or sexually harassing them or, you know. So there's that moment in our lives, as much as shielded as you think, as much as you think you perhaps haven't done anything between quotes wrong to deserve being dark targeted the the targeting happens you know and 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 in my instance i think his you know when i came back from my studies and having gone to some of the protests one of these stories is being sniped uh, not from a long distance by an israeli soldier and his partner and seeing them uh, seeing his gaze seeing the sniper's gaze as well and seeing the shot being fired and then looking you know um, at his high five um, to his fellow comrade while you know hitting me in the ankle as i recall or recount in the in the piece and it was strange to me that you know it wasn't like he's targeting me and feeling like a sense of shame around it. no it was actually there's that sense of pleasure if you want of uh, making the hit and marking it and successfully hitting it and of course i mean when we think about it i thought about it later i mean that's his job so it, it sounds at least reasonable that Part of his job is uh, to shoot and mark and hit the target. Therefore, once he does it successfully, that means that he's done his job successfully. So I started contemplating this this whole you know living within the sniper's gaze because I think um, that is also a part and parcel of many young Palestinian men experience, specifically in this world, but also women, of course, of being hit by bullets in protests that are largely. Um, you know, uh, you know, nonviolent, or you know, if there's throwing of rocks, it's unmilitary. Uh, um, that can easily handle rocks without, you know, going all the way towards killing. You know, and you know, then you you start realizing that you live um, in a world since your young age that marks you as a target, that racializes you to become a target, that use you through the scope of the the sniper's gaze 
that also enacts what you know, maybe perhaps Ishil Mbembe. You know, Ishil, I don't know if you know his work, New mm-hmm. Kripal, but part of New Politics was based on the Palestinian experience. I mean, his theorization around New Politics is heavily tied also to the Palestinian experience and other, of course, contexts as well. And he looks at this power of who you kill and who you let live as part and parcel of, of systems of power, specifically, um, you know, um, in places where, you know, settler colonialism exists or for various forms of oppression or oppressive systems. And in Palestine, it extends to things like who you arrest and don't arrest or um, which village do you place a checkpoint on and which village you don't place a checkpoint on. It, it, you know, this choice that you have, the power of choosing the target, the power of making uh, through this marking and through the hitting the target successfully, whether through arrest or killing or injuring or maiming or, or otherwise, um, a lesson for the rest of society around what it means uh, to confront this Israeli power this Israeli Negro politics, this Israeli power of arrest or incarceration power that it exercises daily in Palestinian life. So for me, I mean, I think I was attempting to personalize it, to to, to, to speak about it from my own personal experience and other people's experience in the piece. But at the same time, I was trying to point to different elements to it. You know, his smile, his high five, but also my rejoinder, which is was the smile, because I smiled at that moment. Uh, of the absurdity of his uh, uh, of his you know taking joy in, in hitting me mm-hmm. uh, and you know there's that kind of exchange between even when I was a kid and you know I was recalling also the stories of playing soccer and being hit with this barrage of bullets on the playing field by a tank in a nearby settlement that also in that moment um, um, you know we laughed I mean the we survived and then we started we cracked out laughing and we started making fun of each other for who ran faster you know like that was the 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 joke at that time you know like between mm-hmm. us you know being pompous like young let's say uh young men I, I wouldn't say young men but children still and you know making fun of each other for who ran fast and we were making fun of somebody who who was you generally in when playing soccer or football um you know he would be the slowest and now he became the fastest and oh you have that in you and so we start cracking because there's that absurdity of being targeted without you know any reason or logic to it but at the same time there was that kind of burst of laughter that was you know taking kind of like after this large inhale and exhale that we survived it and um you know i was trying to recall these experiences in so far i was trying and attempting to relay to people who haven't been in Palestine, um, who perhaps know it from far away, what me- what it means to really live as a target, to live as somebody who's marked uh, from the moment of birth, again, through this racialized oppressive system, yeah? Yeah, and I mean, I think the piece is, is powerful in that regard. You know, I, I definitely, you know, that came across to me reading it. Um, one of the sections I wanted to pull out, so you write, Uh, The sniper, a lone figure in the grand theater of war, stands as a classic incarnation of remote death, executing the grim dictates of murder from a distance, a ghost-like figure entwining weapons and desire. Paradoxically, amidst the ravages of Gaza today, the sniper's role has evolved into one of the most personal and intimate forms of lethal engagement, um, end quote. And so obviously there you're talking about how you know, that it's rare that someone would be even close enough up as they're enacting this violence that they would be as close as a sniper might be. Um, And from there, you kind of get into this discussion, which is a a key part of the piece, too, around, you know, the automation of warfare. Um, You know, others have talked about the gamification of war, you know, turning it from um, soldiers on a battlefield into something that's closer to a video game, you know, um, where someone's at a computer and, and you know, you know, I mean, folks think about this with drones, but we're actually, and this is an interesting aspect um, of this, of this war, just from an intellectual standpoint of 
um you know we're actually sort of past drones in a certain way i mean they're still obviously a part of what's going on and and um but there's automation of so many more elements that's going on and um you know even the inclusion of artificial intelligence and so um you know this has been a long process it's something we've talked with you a bit in our prior conversations just of this notion that um you know israeli soldiers are not used to having to fight wars in person um most of the the warfare has been um you know these aerial kind of bombing campaigns and things like that um and and we're seeing you know and i think this is an interesting element too that we'll talk about as we go through this discussion but we're also seeing significant losses among Israeli soldiers when they're going into Gaza in this in this context. Um, and so in this piece, you're you're wrestling with this question of sort of what does it mean for artificial intelligence systems to wage war? So if you could yeah, share some of your reflections on on that aspect. I mean, to be honest, like part of the, the piece is, is a reading of like, let's say, the psychology of the sniper. Um, the one who does the killing, and also the psychology behind these systems, let's put it that way, um, in a sense of how um, a, a sniper in this instance celebrates his own intrusion on, um, you know, a scene that he looks uh, at from a distance. It's a very voyeuristic element to the sniper. You know, he's watching, he sits there for hours. I mean, that was not the context, perhaps, of my hit, this was like a regular army a sniper. It wasn't like a special operation where somebody stands, you know, for nine hours waiting for, a, you know, a target that uh, he wants to assassinate because it's an important or high profile. But generally, that's the image of the sniper, who's somebody who's uh, uh, comfortable with being secluded, uh, somebody comfortable with being for hours in the same position, somebody who takes pleasure witnessing people from afar, uh, this voyeuristic. Uh, component and then deciding when to intrude on the scene and when to intrude on other people's narrative and ending perhaps these narratives through the ability to kill or let live again as you know echoing Ashil Mbembe's theorization of Negro uh, uh, power or Negro politics and in, in, in many instances I think um, to me it was always you know, it was always interesting to try and figure out the psychology. Why, you know, as a Palestinian growing up in Ramallah or, you know, in Gaza or any place, anywhere else, I did feel that in, in, in many instances, Palestinians shied away from trying to understand their own killers. And by understanding, I don't mean justifying their own killers. No, like there's a thread between justifying and uh, understanding and maybe it's a it's a it's a narrow uh, you know hairline but I think it's still central to to understand that psychology behind how you're rendered a target then targeted and what machines or systems allow it to happen without any kind of remorse or or otherwise of course this is not to say that some Israelis for example like organization like break the silence um, you know, beyond any people's reservations on them, that there's not these kind of like parapaxises where you have soldiers, you know, feeling guilty or some soldier who felt the humanity of the Palestinian kid and then decided not to kill them or some soldier who decided to become not a soldier or a Zionist who was in the West Bank and then decided to unlearn his Zionism. There's all these stories, you know, one of them is Miko Palid who, you know, speaks openly in support of the Palestinian cause, for instance. He's the son of an Israeli general, and you know you can find him all over YouTube, just a, as one instance of that. And um, the more you kind of like peel through the discourses of some of these, let's say, more critical uh, Israeli soldiers and how they also remember, you know, render their own narrative about their service in the Israeli army, and you read through these testimonies, or perhaps going to a you know a Netflix show like Fauda which is, uh, you know, in Hebrew, Balagan, you know, it's, uh, you know, you can, you can penetrate some of this psychological aspect of the special operations, uh, um, um, you know, soldier of the sniper, of the person who's pursuing the hunt, and of how, in many instances, and that was, was kind of eerie and uncanny for a lot of, you know, for me, at least person looking at this, 
there's a strange exulting, there's a strange heightening of the power of the prey, in this case, the Palestinian. Even in Falda, you almost see the, the Palestinian antagonist. You know, he's, he's, of course, he's rendered kind of evil, but you kind of understand him. They don't want to turn him into a complete evil figure, the Palestinian resistance fighter at that, you know, in that show. But they also heighten his power. You know, they, they make him somebody, you know, a very difficult prey to hunt a very difficult and you know in many instances in you know living in the west bank specifically not in gaza where you know the power of the of arresting at least for a long time was suspended um um in in in, in, the, in the larger sense you know in, in the west bank most people who do a act of resistance or an operation they get caught in a very short span of time at least in the past 16 years or so some haven't been caught like in a in a fast space in a fast pace, but most people are caught or killed even in the moment of doing the act itself. So it was always, it sounded strange to me. It looks strange to me to see how this Israeli psychology also builds its own antagonists as more powerful than perhaps the Palestinians themselves read themselves as powerful. Like there's kind of this gulf between how we perceive ourselves and our own agency and how that show kind of like showed it in a in a way that exaggerated the power of the prey in, in many ways so there, there's that element to it but then there's the element of this conflicted you know israeli special operation you know unit it's the arabized unit they speak arabic they pretend to be arabs you know these arabized unit were meant to solve a problem in the israeli military in the 80s where how to penetrate a refugee camp in gaza strip or in the west bank that is very narrow and any entry of military vehicles always causes a lot of chaos and uh you know fouled up balagan which is chaos and um it basically warned anybody who's in these refugee camps that they have to, uh, if they're wanted figures by the Israeli military, that they can run away. So it was hard to arrest people. So the Israelis ca came with this new technique, which is that they dress like Palestinians and you know um, imitate Palestinians, mimic them, so they can easily reach their targets without being you know uh, uh, in, through surprise. Like the surprise element was the most important element, and this is the the whole let's say. Uh, dynamic of the Fauda series and what we see in that series is not only this exalting this hiding up of the Palestinian antagonist but also at the same time um, you know uh, a level of I think that you know in Western uh, mass media and the consumption of series you know like we always like that police figure that wants to rebel against the legal constraints of the law itself you know Actually, the policeman becomes kind of the, the person who's uh, transgressing the law, you know? like because the law is confining him from doing what is right. Uh, it's constraining him, and we see all these policemen lashing out against all these constraints that are actually meant to preserve people's, you know, rights, at least in the context of the U.S. and, and in other places. And we see that also with with Falda, where these kind of legal constraints are being criticized. Uh, by these military units that we should be able to to act without you know uh, without with impunity and without real consideration um, to any kind of legal constraints because the wilderness of Gaza the West Bank of Lebanon it doesn't understand these form of constraints the real enemy there is not the Palestinian the real enemy is this liberal legal uh, state that constrains the Israeli from true victory it's 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 this is the the, the true enemy in, in the fold for me at least personally and the palestinian just highlights this enmity of the military institution with its own let's say laws that it's supposed to actually uphold and protect of course this is taken into consideration that when it comes to the west bank this kind of liberal legal constraints have never really been you know uh around i know i've been you know talking a lot but i think um uh, one of the issues, at least, that, that comes also across is this fascination with the prey, exalting it and presenting it both as an obstacle and then as a test of your own prowess. So mm -hmm. in many ways, the Palestinian for the Israeli sniper, for the Israeli military machine, for the Israeli AI system, represents this kind of test reality testing in, in psychological terms. Um, and it 
uh, we represent some sort of uh, a prey that once we're killed, once we're marked and for and and, and demise, when, once we're manhunted and captured or killed, um, this Israeli psychology of triumphalism, of invincibility, as we were saying, of feeling your your own prowess, can be also felt internally, and then you can reaffirm kind of your identity as as a as a as a Israeli soldier as a pioneer in, in military technology and techniques, as somebody who, who can safeguard himself as a rejoinder if we want to also, uh, you know, a part of Jewish history where, you know, a lot of Zionists critiqued, um, you know, the way uh, the Holocaust happened on the basis that many of the Holocaust victims did not resist or did not show any signs of resistance, although that's kind of also exaggerated in many ways in terms of reading that history as well but at least zionism came as a rejoinder that it's about jewish power it's about you know asserting our own uh, uh dominance uh through this kind of military infrastructure that we're going to build and it, it embodied in the the, the israeli defense forces etc and i feel like in many ways this catch me if you get, can game is part of this repetitive need within this Israeli psyche for this reality testing all the time, you know? Of course, it's it's also a system of control. It's an oppressive system of control. But for me, it was interesting also to try and attempt to understand that kind of psychology, the psychology of, of the sniper himself, before, before talking about the impact of the gaze and, and how we internalize this gaze in our daily life in many ways, you know? Um, but yeah, that's, that's at least part of it. And I think the AI system, just as a last note, here, it's just a new addition of a settler society trying to survive within a region um, that uh, within the context of it attempting to replace the Palestinian indigenous people, kicking it out and ethnically cleansing them, and with also within a region that is generally sympathetic and empathetic to the Palestinian people or support their liberation struggle. And the ASI system represents the solution between also this kind of liberal um, Tel Aviv lifestyle that exists in this bubble of partying and restaurants and bars and parties. Um, this modern, let's say, state, uh, the Sodom of Israel, if you want, like this place where everything is permitted, uh, desires and pleasures, and living this kind of postmodern life where, you know, you becoming a soldier that has to put themselves in, 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 in the eye of danger in fighting wars in Gaza or Lebanon is not something that you truly desire. You, you actually want to run away from that. You, you're not here to, to sacrifice yourself or your body for the state anymore. You want the state to, to attempt to preserve your lifestyle um, with, your, with the economic privilege that comes with it, with the ability to travel the world and um, you know go around the world with your first world passport with the ability to live this kind of um you know hedonistic lifestyle in, in tel aviv or otherwise you're not really the type that is going to go to gaza and, and attempt to sacrifice himself i'm not i'm not speaking to the entire israeli society there are in israeli society people are more willing to sacrifice specifically from the religious Zionist camp or from other you know ideological orientations um you know that have that kind of willingness or this kind of still desire to like uh, be the hero of the Israeli state, etc. But generally speaking, this is the the sense of you know the modern the postmodern society. And I think AI systems, um, you know, the anti-rocket systems as well, all these systems that are being created as a technical solution to warfare and to fighting Palestinian resistance as a Lebanese resistance is a is a symptom of a, a society that is incapable of, of, of conducting warfare on terms of sacrifice. It's a, it, an AI is just another version of how the settler society attempts to resurrect and sustain its longevity uh, in Palestine um, through technical developments all the time. And I, I just want to understress that Israel actually invests a lot in this in terms of recruitment, in terms of the people that it 
uh, takes into, you know, special programs uh, that work in IT systems or high tech. It, it benefits its, its civil economy, but it's also part of its military complex of how to create these systems. And then we have these revelation about this AI, AI system that actually produces the targets in Gaza Strip. It's fed through target files that supposedly the intelligence community feeds. And then the AI system creates these targets and produces them. And then the airplanes uh, drop these weapons on these targets. And what we see, at least through the parameters or whatever you want to call it, is that basically in the Gaza Strip, the Israeli army is still so trying to attempt, to, attempting to still sustain some sort of military logic to, to talking about target, you know, target files, to talking about you know, how it feeds the system that produces its target, but it's also outsourcing the targeting and the choice of target. And it's also outsourcing the through machines, the way it conducts the target through killing uh, across a distance. And, and that means that in many ways, most of the warfare we're seeing is a warfare that is done uh, at a distance. It, it resembles the sniper, but even the sniper in this case would be actually paradoxically one of the most intimate forms of killing because at least you see directly the people who you're going to uh, shoot or kill or maim or or, or make disappear uh, through your bullet. In this case, you know, the pilot doesn't see it. The operator of a drone um, sees, you know, small dots on, on a screen. Um, the gamification, as you said, of, of how killing is done. And that also goes to another question. I mean, I don't think it's a very central question necessarily, but we've always raised it here among some friends. It's like, what is you know a more ethical way of killing an intimate killing or a killing from a distance? Uh, is actually you know killing somebody with a knife? Maybe all killing is wrong. I don't know, but in, in many ways, is killing somebody intimately um, through this bodily entanglement more? ethical because you can see the victim of your murderous act or is it actually through a distance and what is more ethical in, and that's the paradox that i'm also talking about this the, in, in my piece of also killing and being killed in the same act like many palestinian resistance fight, including in october 7th let's remember that most of those who entered the gaza envelope actually entered knowing that they will probably end up either killed or imprisoned so they will actually um, you know, uh, conducting an act of martyrdom or sacrifice um, in the moment or killing through a distance, through sanitized boardrooms, through, you know, sitting on a screen and seeing your machine just unleash anger through the skies. I don't have an answer to that question, but, you know, it's just a question that we can ask, perhaps. Yeah, well, you said a lot there, um, and I appreciate all of those reflections. Shout out to folks in the chat. Hello, other Jared, good to see you. Um, uh, I mean, one, I wanted to say that I have started watching Fauda now um, because of, you, you know, you were asking me about it and you've talked about it a few times. And so it's interesting. I've only started, so I don't have a lot of reflections I can share. One is interesting, though, on a basic level, which is that they, you know, obviously it's it's produced by, you know, in Israel by Israelis. Um, it's, it's in, uh, it's in Hebrew predominantly, right. And then, um, Arabic in terms of the, the Palestinians. But what's interesting is when you watch it in the U S context, you're watching it in English or you, you know, I do, you could just watch it in Hebrew with the subtitles. Um, but what's interesting is that they translate the Hebrew and they translate it two different ways. So if you listen to the dubbed version, there's different dialogue and discussion than what's in uh, the subtitles. It's close. So it's kind of two different interpretations, but it is interesting just seeing those differences. And then it's also interesting that they don't make any effort at all to dub or translate the Palestinians. Right. And so, um, you know, obviously this is intended just by Netflix, even in the U S context, to present, um, you know, these these English speakers who are actually really speaking um, in Hebrew on the show, but they dub it over like it's being spoken in English, but they don't do that for uh, the Palestinian characters. So there's already just linguistically something that they're doing in um, a Western context to make sure you understand 
that even though you might want to sympathize with one group of people, these are actually the good guys and the bad guys based on the languages that they speak. Um, and so I, I found that interesting, just, you know, starting to check it out. Um, I mean, it's uh, just to remember, it's a it's a it's a Hasbara product. It's it's meant to yeah. actually make you feel affinity with the Israeli. Uh, I mean, I'm not trying to promote it uh, in any way. No, so. I know. I And I watch it as I watch bad stuff. I mean, you know, you were talking about these, uh, you know, I mean, we we use the term propaganda in our context to talk about shows like this, which just means it's propaganda for policing. And, yeah. um, you know, in, in the United States, uh, this is like 95 percent of all of our shows are some form of propaganda, essentially, whether it's, you know, military, whether it's police, whether it's FBI shows or CIA shows or whatever. Um, and so we're very used to this. And obviously, um, there's a lot of people who uncritically, most people, I would say, uncritically and just kind of enjoy it for what it is. But uh, there's a, a significant number of us, of course, that are very critical of this. And, it, you know, there's work that's been gone, done by many to lay out how that this is actually supposed to, you know, I mean, we would say it's supposed to to sort of promote the capitalist system and make you identify with the people who separate the haves from the have nots within our system. Um, certainly though, you know, you have to deal with the, the, all the context of how policing is, is racialized, right. It's based on settler logics. Um, and that thing that you were talking about, about the, you know, the promotion of the cop who transgresses the law. I mean, I think this is interesting on multiple contexts. I mean, one, because like some of my friends who really get into the policing stuff, like I, I think about Brandon Soderbergh's uh, work um, that he did on like a Baltimore gun trace task force. But um, and also some of my lawyer friends, you know, they would say like, you know, cop, the law doesn't really have anything to do with policing. Like the police actually create the law by transgressing it in a certain way. Right. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's interesting in that respect because these are these, like you say, they're sort of rights or, um, you know, these things that are supposed to protect us from the law, uh, from police transgressing the law or whatever. But, you know, when police do transgress the law, they're, like in, in Soderbergh's context, one of the things he talks about is that um, he goes through all the Fourth Amendment violations, right? And so he goes through the ways that um, there's illegal search and seizure all the time. There's there's cops just stop people and search them. Cops break into people's houses and take stuff. And, you know, and that even if this is found to be in violation of the Fourth Amendment, all that happens is after the fact, the person who's charged with these things might end up being released, but nothing ever happens to the police officers who transgress the Fourth Amendment, <laughs> you know, because it's just sort of expected that they have kind of immunity, right, from that sort of um, that there should be some accountability for them to actually follow the law, you know. Um, and so it's interesting in that aspect. And I think it does get to sort of the AI and, you know, the drone conversation before that. And, um, you know, also my mother. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, sorry to, and also urban warfare experts. I mean, right. I'm one of the people that, you know, have these kind of, uh, you know, I follow a lot of urban war experts in the U.S. just to see what they're saying about, you know, Israel. And they're the most celebratory of Israeli practice now mm -hmm. in, in Gaza because Israel is opening a space, you know, it's opening a space for how to conduct warfare in the future. And that's one of the also the elements I kind of mentioned in the piece is that, you know what you're talking about is like the cop transgressing the law is also like law making power you know like it's you're you're also recreating and reformating the laws you were you were mentioning and israel is recreating also rules of law of warfare i mean and it's creating new legal framework to how to conduct these operations in a way that you know actually reframes this global you know order international law the international institutions international uh, humanitarian law and rules of war in a way that also will help the empire in its future wars wherever it conducts them. So, like, so Israel is a place. It's a it's a it's a transgressor of law that has always been celebrated by the imperial center and by those who serve the empire itself as a place to learn from 
what we can do in other contexts of warfare. And of course, I mean, I'm not saying that it's only Israel. I mean, of course, American war in Afghanistan served Israel, etc. And it's a, it's a trade and exchange. But, you know, at least this war will provide a lot of lessons to be learned for these military experts to then reappropriate in other wars. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think about like in just to give two examples of what you're talking about, you know, as I see it, like one, you know, during the Obama administration, you know, there was always these examples of like bombing weddings, you know, drone bombing weddings and things like this and say, you know, well, there was one target, right? You know, it's a high value target. And so you, you know, you kill 70 people or whatever to take out the the individual, right? And obviously, you know, I think most people of any level of good conscience would say that's horrific, like that's horrendous. You know, how, how could you possibly justify that even if you felt like that person was was just, you know, horrible and had been had done X, Y and Z. Right. Um, and like in in the context, I think, of what we've seen, you know, in Gaza and, and in the West Bank now more and more, you know, like these attacks on hospitals, um, which I know are also not new in um, the Palestinian context, but it's just seems to just continue escalating, um, you know, to the extent where, um, you know, there was an outcry, you know, um, around, I think the Baptist hospital, uh, you know, my translation is probably not good there, but, um, you know, it's sort of towards the beginning. And yet that was kind of, and, you know, um, it, it was special. It was an outlier, I guess, in certain ways, because there had been all of these other targeting before this of medical facilities and so on and ambulances and things like this. And then this continues afterwards. And, you know, we see the U.S. as this is going on, you know, unwilling to to basically say that that's that that's not OK. Right. Like they'll, they'll use some kind of language to say, well, you know, we're concerned about it or like, you know, we, we care about the the level of civilians and we think too many civilians are being killed, that sort of kind of language. But they won't just say, well, actually, yeah, that is that's not allowed under international law, you know. Um, and and so, yeah, I mean, you can see how it just becomes an escalation and new tactics become, you know, normative, um, you know, through that kind of escalation you know um i i'll i'll go on to another question so um so there's a discussion in the text of kind of the acceptance of um the positionality of being a target right and so your friend ibrahim discusses smiling at his sniper um you've already mentioned this as well in your in your case um and ibrahim muses about whether this is a form of madness um, I appreciated these reflections and your conclusions uh, in the piece, kind of bringing it back to how does this relate to resistance as well? Um, in some ways, it picks up from our last conversation where we talked about, you know, sort of the calculus of resistance, right? Where if you just got into some sort of mathematical discussion or discussion about how many lives will be lost if we resist and things like that, then um, it would make it seem sort of nonsensical. Um, you know, but it's not a mathematical equation. So talk a little bit about that conundrum as you're thinking about it in this piece or in this context. I mean, to me, it's, it's, it goes, I mean, we, 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 I attempted in the beginning to talk about like, you know, the psychology of the one who's doing the hunting, you know, like the Israeli machine itself, um, and how it sets up the space that we live in, you know? And that space includes internalizing this case of, of the sniper, of the possibility of becoming a target, of being rendered a target, either for arrest, killing, maiming, uh, whatever policy, of, or trying all your life to prevent yourself from getting on the ra radar of becoming such a target. And of course, when we talk about that in the context of Palestine, you're talking about, for instance, not participating politically. Uh, only being concerned with your own uh, uh, family. You know, I mean, now we have a new generation in the West Bank of Palestinians that I teach, young kids um, who, in many ways, when you ask them about politics, they tell me, for instance, politics brings, in Arabic, we say, we say in you know, which means politics brings a headache, no? And 
I don't I just don't want to think about politics. It's not a realm that should I should engage in. And then I asked them, okay, why did you reach this conclusion that politics is something that you should not engage with? And they just said, like, it's not, it's out of the domain of my interest. You know, it's out of the domain of my interest. Generally, they personalize it, but then I explained to them how their previous generation of parents, you know, who who actually had this collective dream and attempted a sort of liberation in the first, second, and the father or beforehand, many of whom were tortured in prison. You know, we have 800 to a million Palestinian prisoners since 67, for instance, just to talk about, you know, this policy of mass confinement. So when I'm talking about imprisonment, I'm not talking about imprisoning, you know, individuals. We're talking about a military law that imprisons people for, you know, the law, if you if you are 10 people protesting, then you could be imprisoned or you have administrative detention where there's a secret file against you. Like, just look at recently when we had 3,000 or 4,000 Palestinians now being arrested uh, in a mass arrest campaign. And of course, these 3,000, 4,000 Palestinians arrested, the vast majority have not done anything to get arrested. It's just that they're being categorized within an Israeli bureaucracy and system as the most arrestable Palestinians in this context. Because perhaps in their history 10 years ago, like I know people who 10 years ago were arrested uh, and they have lived their life since then 12, 13 years they have not done anything politically, disengaged, etc. And all of a sudden they're arrested again because, you know, 12 years ago or somewhat, they're arrested in a case that involved being part of Hamas uh, political structure or part of Hamas's, uh, you know, a charity work or part of, you know, or part of Islamic Jihad something or being a student activist here or being part of a student movement there, um, things like that. So you, you, you have this kind of mass uh, confinement campaign. So what I'm trying to say is that, you know, in, in this expansive interpretation of what it means to become political here, people have only the choice if they want to evade, let's say, being a target, choice of living a life that has no collective dream at the heart of it, you know, that has no collective form of affirmation of your existence through your identity. You just stick to the personal intimacy of your life, the things, the little things like friendship or, you know, uh, your family, uh, you know, the enclosed doors of the safe boundaries of your home that, you know, remains unpolitical. And I think for this generation, a lot of the students, when I explain that, you know, maybe you think politics is a headache because it's an intergenerational trauma, you know, it's a, it's a form of of trauma that has been distilled by your parents who are scared that you would go into politics and who teach you to stay away from politics since you're a young age because that's what parents should do. I mean, they should try to protect their sons and daughters by, you know, disallowing them, uh, um, you know, attempting to not, you know, uh, for them not to go in a protest where a sniper exists and can shoot you in the leg. And I mean, I, I didn't say in that in my story, but, you know, when I was shot, I couldn't tell my mother that I was shot because if my mother uh, at that moment, knew that I was shy. I went to the hospital. I had the, uh, you know, wrapped, and then the next day I go to my parents' house, and you know, crunching. I still didn't get the pull it out, and I tell my parents I was shot, you know, and because I already was shot, they took it, you know, well. But if I told them in the moment, um, you know, all hell would have uh, broken on me, you know, why were you there? What you're doing, etc. And, you know, perhaps if the sniper didn't kill me, my mother would have. So in many ways, I mean, uh, uh, at least for me um, and for a lot of other Palestinians, that intergenerational trauma plays a role. So when you internalize the gaze and you, you sustain it in your life, it's actually when you try to mostly evade, you know, the sniper's lens. It's, it's that moment. I think what I'm trying to say is that the, the most depoliticized Palestinians are the most uh, perhaps unconscious internalizers of the Israeli targeting system. They're the ones that have attempted to take out themselves from that radar of the gaze by internalizing it, become part of their interior subjectivity in a way that actually, in some cases, it becomes part of their unconscious state of mind in terms of their relation to the world and the relation to politics of collective dreams, etc. And you can see it whether in the old generation or the younger generation. And we can see it perhaps in a political system that exists in the West Bank, 
um, led by, for instance, uh, the current uh, PA, the Palestinian National Authority, which has internalized this gaze to the extent that it's not willing to engage politically in any way, shape, or form. So for the Israeli machinery, warfare machinery, for the symbolic machinery, the Palestinians should either surrender, should either recognize Israel as a legitimate state, uh, and then make the Israeli theft of Palestinian land whole and sovereign. Um, you know, that's what we're being asked. There's always that Israeli obsession, not of only recognizing Israel, but also recognizing Israel as a Jewish state. Um, there's always kind of like uh, an obsessive demand from the Israelis on Palestinians place to, to, to recognize Israel in different ways, its shape, its character, its identity. Um, and it's strange to me because if you're fully comfortable with your own claim on the land, why would you ask the indigenous people to recognize it? It's, it's as if only through this kind of triumphant symbolic surrender that the Palestinians could offer the Israelis. And we act here as vanishing mediators, like we recognize that their legitimacy and then perhaps we we completely disappear from sight. Um, so in many ways, I think for me, it's a critique also for those who are depoliticizing Palestinian context and internal critique of, I see them as holding the sniper in their, in their, in their, uh, in their very being and fabric, in their very interiority. While I see Brahim, for instance, facing the sniper's gaze, not being afraid of the consequences of, of facing it, facing this machinery of death. I see that perhaps, you know, and this is where madness comes in. Perhaps it's a mad act. No, it's you're facing a sniper that can kill you. But I see him as the, the figure that is most liberated from the sniper's case. It's facing it. It's not evading it. It's not interiorizing it and forgetting about it. It's it's in in, in facing it and and in acknowledging and interpolating that your own um, death is possible, that your own imprisonment is possible. Of course, that if you want to act an act of resistance, that you're a doomed man, as many revolutionaries have told have told us before. But. That is the most liberated person, at least in the Palestinian context, is the one that faces the gay, you know, the gaze of the sniper or faces the scope of the sniper without budging. Um, and this is, a, you know, I'm, you know, this is a metaphor. I'm not saying that that's what people should do, you know, but I'm saying that uh, in a metaphoric sense, I think this is where resistance interplays, and that's why resistance is all about submission to the now. It's about submission to that moment where you're not afraid of that case and and that's the only case where you can actually be truly liberated um from that machinery and you know perhaps transgress its uh, expectations from you and um you know exceed uh, it and challenge it and act on it as well and that's why for me resistance somewhat is madness but i don't want to like take it into a political realm where, you know, people are, you know, could accuse resistance of not having a logical, strategic, right. and political goal. Uh, it's always dangerous territory. Here, I'm only speaking at the individual level. I'm not speaking at perhaps a more organizational level, although we can also see perhaps on a more organizational level, that level of opening history without knowing the true consequences of what could happen or what could transpire. But again, the figure that is most liberated is the one that faces that sniper without budging. Yeah. I appreciate that. Uh, I was looking around because Thomas Sankara has a quote about a certain amount of madness uh, as being necessary for revolutionaries. And um, this comment in the chat, I wanted to pull this up because this is what I was thinking about, too, as you were talking about this. It sounds like some boomer parents from the civil rights era did trying to protect us from trauma, but unfortunately didn't prepare us well for what we face today. This discussion of depoliticization um, is a very... You know, I don't think we have enough discussions about this in the United States context. Um, and sometimes it's good to some respect because part of the problem in the United States is that you can be a Democrat or a Republican, but you can't be anything else. Right. And so um, if you're a socialist, if you're a communist, if you're an anarchist, if you um, support anti-colonial resistance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all of these things um you know, basically fall outside of um, what is allowable or discussable as real political 
agenda, even to a level of like when we get these surveys, right, from our our parties and stuff like that about like, what do you say? Like the only thing that you can say is that I'm very liberal. You could say I'm somewhat liberal or I'm very liberal. <laughs> And so, you know, you're not allowed to to even express in um, some legible way, um, like, no, actually, like, I believe in a society that's organized in a completely different way than the one that we have currently. Um, but it's, you know, and that's Palestine, in the context. Yeah, go ahead. Palestine, a liberal is a curse. It's uh, yeah. it's also used as a, although everybody like, I mean, I always joke that everybody in Palestine is a liberal, kind of. I mean, it's uh, <laughs> even like Hamas and it's, for example, somewhat of its politics of like democratic participation and such. I'm not like truly against it, but you cannot actually come out, you know, and say I'm a liberal. Nobody, you know, uh, would take you seriously and it, they would make fun of you and ridicule you completely. You know, that's. Uh, yeah. And that's certainly true within, you know, sort of the 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 anti-capitalist left i'll call it within the united states that you know nobody would you know intentionally identify themselves with this but yet it is still like the dominant um yeah. you know political you know and and anyway um so that that depoliticization is really interesting and i think it also relates to what you were talking about too about people's experiences of prior generations with all the state repression you know Intel Pro in our context and, um, you know, things like this, um, you know, yeah, I mean, it, it it's very hard on families. And there's a way, of course, that we kind of then can generalize that out into all of our politics, even those of us whose families didn't, you know, experience that form of repression, but just kind of saw it or bore witness to it. Um, anyway, it's an interesting thing. Um, so. The other thing I did want to talk to you about a little bit is getting to some of the strategic tactical developments as they're going on currently. I mean, one of the things that's interesting about these systems is that, you know, I have a sense that the less people get used to actually fighting, you know, the harder it is for them um, the less prepared that they are. Right. The, so the development, and you talked about this, in some extent with you know discussion of um the doctrine of the iron wall obviously we have the iron dome as a technology um you know we have drones we have you have all of this technology all of this development of technology is really um you know palestine and gaza in particular but also the west bank like this is a a hub of where these technologies are developed and then exported out um and actually promoted by companies like elbit systems as you know, this has been tested in Palestine, so you know that it's the best um, kind of technology, whether it's surveillance or military technology, things like that. And yet these are still vulnerable systems. And we're seeing that, um, you know, Hezbollah yesterday took out a couple of the, the batteries of the um, Iron Dome in the north. And I don't know exactly what the implications of that are, but it seems significant. Um, and then you know, you have the fact that at some point, especially when, as happened on October 7th, Palestinian resistance actually takes the war to um, Israelis to a certain extent, you, you kind of get in a position where you have to be able to respond militarily or at least defend militarily in a kind of person to person um, sort of scenario. And so it seems that an interesting state right now in terms of obviously the humanitarian crisis going on in, in Gaza right now is just, you know, is horrible. Right. And is, a, a, is something that we should all be, you know, pushing for a ceasefire and thinking about this, but on the military level, um, it does seem like Israel is really struggling to, um, you know, develop any kind of wins or any kind of even, you know, real talking points about what it's doing and, and how it is being successful in certain ways or things like that. Um, you know, and I mean, we get a lot of the videos, if those of us who follow, you know, resistance and things like that, we see, you know, the blowing up of tanks and, um, you know, all of these things. And so I'm just interested in how you think about that in relation to this piece as well, because I think it is related in terms of 
um that kind of the sniper the strategic distance the the becoming less and less capable on some level of engaging in in military combat in a sort of more traditional sense i mean it's uh you know like i think that is actually part of one of the biggest you know let's say um weaknesses of israeli society at this juncture is that it's incapable not in the extreme sense of incapable in a sense that i want to like you know um completely divide and i think it's always a mistake if analysts come in and say like you know they underestimate the israelis and their capacities and their power etc i mean it's always a mistake not because you know um they're not defeatable but but also because they it doesn't mean that they don't have also you know a lot of strong points and a lot of capabilities and abilities but at least this is a war that the palestinian resistance chose its timing you no know? and it's a war that the palestinian resistance surprised israelis with and it's a war that jawed is drew israel into the gaza strip and drew israel in a moment where the resistance was ready for a ground uh, warfare within the strip i mean they knew that if they did this operation that there will be a ground operation within the strip so um perhaps they didn't know the amount of destruction that they would israel would be willing to use in terms of its air power but at least they knew that there will be a ground warfare and a ground maneuver and that it will be a long phase one that needs the resistance uh, to sustain itself through a long time and remember once israel entered into the gaza strip it's not entering into uh, a place where a regular army exists and then they can take this regular army assets like what happened in the us and iraq and defeat the you know the, the iraqi uh, regular army in, in in a couple of weeks and then enter and you know showcase its power and then meet an insurgency only a year later from its occupation of the iraq uh, of Iraq in 2003. In this case, it's an insurgency waiting for the, the army to come in and to start hitting them in, in a way that sustains the struggle over a long time and sustains injuries and damage to their uh, armored vehicles, to their personnel and to their soldiers. And where the occupation of space, this occupation of space in a, in a traditional regular sense, is not the most fundamental part of the struggle because you have created an underground space that is complex, that we know little about, that is very well kept and in depth and deep within, while running also a psychological information warfare and uh, maintaining your rocket capabilities over a long time. So what we're seeing, at least from resistance, after 74 days, I think, is that it's still maintaining its capacity to hurt the Israelis within the Gaza Strip, either and in intensifying it even, if we want. You know, after the, the ceasefire, we have a, a higher rate of injury and kills among Israeli soldiers than before the ceasefire. So we have an interesting also um, release of, of videos of Palestinian fighters. Even yesterday, um, it was one of the most, uh, you know, perhaps significant releases, three, four videos in the same days and with different psychological messages on the kidnap, but also on the, the actions, the using of cornet against a military jeep or hammer, um, and also the stealing perhaps the footage or hacking some of the footage of the Israeli army itself. So you had all of these different you know, uh, uh, messages coming in. And what we saw from the Israeli side is, um, you know, um, I, I don't think, uh, we saw much in terms of even their own information and video. We saw some footage from air power killing some of the high, you know, Palestinian fighters, you know, in, in some instances. Um, this is where their strength lies, you know, through drones and detecting and then firing rockets at uh, people on the ground. But in terms of face-to-face -face combat, I think there was only one or two videos um, that the Israeli army released throughout this whole period. And even when they have a, a footage of combat, their soldiers are shooting at you know uh, nothing. You know, like it's uh, walls, it's a, right? Walls. I mean, I, I'm sure. I don't know who's running their uh, uh, you know uh, operation, propaganda operation. But it, for me, it was astounding to see how amateurish and you know completely 
unprepared they are to create any kind of propaganda of success even. Even with the Shifa hospital complex, even with all their claims. I mean, it all failed. It all like kind of like returned on itself immediately. And also we saw recently what could have been a heroic success of the Israeli army, the release, you know, or the cat, you know, the release of three of the hostages turned into a complete tragedy because this is an army that once it views a civilian in an area is afraid of its own shadow and at the same time sees Palestinians are killable and they killed these three Israeli uh, hostages who somehow perhaps fled their their own like captors or I don't know what happened exactly from the resistance point of view and they were killed by their own army I mean mm -hmm. uh, and not posing any risk, half naked with a white flag. I mean, it's astounding the extent of, you know, uh, it's horrifying for us as Palestinians because we know that that type, if, if they're willing to kill, you know, half naked people with white flags, it tells us what they did in Salah al -Din Street, what they did and what they're doing in when they're meeting and encountering Palestinian civilians, what they're doing when they're, you know, um, in a certain zone where they're, uh, they're faced with the shadow and they're afraid of anything happening because this is what the resistance is doing is that it's hitting and running you know, like hit and run hit and run or booby trapping or doing traps and you have five four three israeli soldiers killed a day 20 injured or something like that and i don't know it depends on what they announce uh, because when it comes to injuries they're also being kind of fuzzy about their announcements of how many injuries there are in terms of what's happening in the fighting and they're hammering men they're hammering some of the commanders um you know the kill rate is still uh, in terms of the israel military is still going on strong and even growing yesterday seven i think today three or four i don't know um so from a tactical point of view i think israelis are in a moment where the contradictions of the military campaign and its lack of success is starting to be detected within their own society how is it being detected it's detected on i think through the figure of the family generally speaking historically for example before israeli withdrew from lebanon in 2000 um, we had the figure of for example a collective of mothers who lost their sons in lebanon who led the campaign for israeli withdrawal from lebanon from the southern uh, uh, lebanese security zone that it was called where the Israelis were uh, in control of southern Lebanon. And they wanted the Israeli army to withdraw uh, into uh, its own territory and to leave the southern Lebanese. And they led, so these mothers of the fallen soldiers were part of the national campaign to convince the Israeli government to move. And they were part and parcel alongside the resistance on the Lebanese side of why the Israelis actually also, uh, 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 you know, withdrew at that historical conjuncture or historical moment. I think what we can see now in Israel is the figure of Israeli families, first of all, the hostage families or the Israeli imprisoned by the resistance families who want their sons and fathers and daughters released immediately and who want, you know, who don't care really if the war stops as long as their family members come home safely. You know? So there's that one side. Of course, in their discourse publicly, they would say, we don't mind the war continuing, but what we prioritize is the return of those imprisoned by the Palestinian resistance safely, um, the mothers and fathers of soldiers captured by the resistance, and, and some of the civilians that are left uh, with, the, with the resistance in the Gaza Strip. Then you have the figure of the families of the soldiers now fighting in Gaza. So... These are families that are now telling their government, why are you risking our soldiers and not using excessive air power uh, more so? Just go and destroy Gaza. Why are you letting our sons and daughters die, or in this case, mostly sons, die in the Gaza Strip, getting injured in the Gaza Strip, getting maimed, getting blown up? Uh, I mean, and you can use other weapons and other forms. And this is a contradictory you know, need because if you only use air power, you'll never win. To really uh, uh, dismantle the resistance within the Gaza Strip, you need to go in and you need to do the dirty work and you need to sacrifice your own soldiers. So just using air power has only a limited utility, at least in a military campaign. At, at some point, it just loses its utility. And, and it already lost it from the first week because the only significant targets that Israeli targeted, perhaps it targeted in the first couple of days. 
uh, in terms of Hamas assets or infrastructure or Palestinian resistant infrastructure that is above ground at least. So when we when we talk about you know when we talk about uh, uh, the current moment, so the, the, this is a contradictory demand coming from the families of people who are fighting in Gaza. Then you have people who are killed on the seventh of October, families of people who were killed, or or families of people who, who want revenge and who are telling their government you should go and you should do it and you should finish the job and and continue with it uh, without any accountability. And then you have the families of the communities of the northern border and the southern border who also, you know, the southern frontiers, the Gaza envelope and the northern frontiers with Lebanon, that want their government to ensure that if they return to these places, that the, the resistance should be dismantled on both sides. So you have an internal Israeli that, of course, everybody agreed we should continue with what, with the war, you know? But it's, they're also making very different competing and at times contradictory demands in terms of of what they want or how they want the military to go about their operations. And this is starting to, you know, come across within Israeli society. This social struggle is coming across. And I think this is a place you can detect already what is very fundamental to any liberation movement is that its success, its assessment of victory and defeat is generally tied to its ability to frustrate its enemy. So to, to frustrate the col the colonialists, to frustrate, um, uh, you know, the Americans in Vietnam. It's not about, you know, meeting them with the same firepower. It's about frustrating them. It's about making them, read, you know, accumulate a lot of frustration. And that frustration sometimes come with excessive demands of what could be expected from their own military or excessive demands for revenge or at the same time, contradictory demands of how you should go about conducting your own operations that we can already see within the structure of, 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 of the social struggle around the military operation in Gaza and Lebanon, whether to expand it or not. And I think this is placing Israel in a very highly uh, uh, tight spot. I, I wrote in the beginning, you know, it, it was just a small thing. I wrote in the beginning in Arabic, I, I call Gaza a labyrinth. No, it's 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 a labyrinth because it, it has already an underground system uh, of of complex uh, tunnels, but also because it will be a labyrinth uh, as it appears to the Israelis. They will enter, but war has its own grammar and its own logic. And as they enter, that logic will start to force itself on the Israelis slowly. I think that's what's happening. It doesn't mean that the resistance necessarily will frustrate the Israelis completely. It doesn't mean the Israelis will not be able to also meet some of the objectives of their campaign or anything like that. But I think what we're starting to see is an accumulation of frustration. Is already Israel losing a lot of credit with its own allies, despite these allies being complicit immediately in the running of this campaign and its nature and in protecting Israel diplomatically, morally, and otherwise, specifically the United States of America, who I think is complicit and is sitting in the war cabinet uh, uh, of the Israelis and, and and participating immediately in the nature of the campaign. I mean, I'm, I'm sure the Israelis at one point, you know, perhaps I'm not like, you know, maybe I'm not sure, but this is just a speculation. But I'm sure that they've informed the Americans there will be a lot of civilian deaths in the tens of mm -hmm. thousands. The Americans gave them the go ahead. So there's at least, uh, you know, that level of complicity. But at least what I'm what, what I'm trying to say is that there's that accumulation of, of frustration alongside from the strategic perspective, the continuation of the, the front in Lebanon and its expansion. And of course, now the withdrawal of a lot of shipping uh, uh, companies uh, from shipping through the Red Sea, uh, which is will cause a crisis in the world economy, not only to the Israelis themselves, because when we're talking about these big sh shipping companies, when they all withdraw, it creates a lot of problem in terms of inflation and otherwise, and that will be bad news for a lot of people in Europe and in the U.S., including Joe Biden himself, who's running for a re-election campaign. And you know, Americans might not care much about you know the regular American might not care not care much about you know uh, Palestine as an issue or be supportive more of of Israel, or whatever. But he'll care about you know gas prices and stuff like that that will start harming him. So that's one level at least from it. And just a last point, I, if I'm, I'm talking a lot, Jared, you can interrupt me as always, but you know, um, one last point, yeah, I mean, and that is that is something that you mentioned also in your question. Every kind of technical kind of solution uh, 
developed in in in, in warfare has its antidote. No, I mean even bacteria. Now we have the super bacteria. No, it's it's fighting insulin. It's fighting you know antibacterial medicine. And for me, it's always important to note that whatever form of technological solution Israel really comes up with. If there's a will on the other side, there's always some sort of way to overcome that, either through adjustment of technique or through, you know, a counter technology that could help or through investment in ways uh, or different means of how you conduct your own warfare. And that's what, you know, part of the agility of the Palestinian resistance in the past 20 years specifically, or at least since the first Intifada. Unlike perhaps somewhat its historical experience with the Palestinian National Movement and the PLO is that it's always in this kind of technical you know uh, creation or counter technical creation for a new technical development even the october 7th attack was a technique to overcome this war by distance by which israelis in the latest campaigns we talked about this i think the last time you know avoided entering into gaza strip or doing a ground maneuver and actually removed the soldiers kilometers back from the gaza border and you know attempted to only fight through the air and through its firepower or through its ships in the sea without really engaging with or entangling itself bodily with the palestinian resistance so october 7th itself was kind of a technique to overcome these systems the walls you know the the iron dome the iron wall that exists between gaza and the gaza envelope and transcending that and transgressing it and providing a counter technique to how uh, to navigate it and hurt the Israelis some way or another uh, uh, through this kind of ta counter tactical uh, arrangement done through this uh, ground or offensive operation. And, and the same with Hezbollah. I mean, Hezbollah has the capacity to detect some of these iron dome systems, has the capacity to take them out, but also has the capacity if a war happens to also attempt to take out some of the planes on the ground, uh, has the capacity. I mean, that's why American carriers came in. They came in within the scenario of planning of the war is that if Israel is deprived of some of its air power assets or needs air power assets, that then you'll have an American uh, uh, carrier that has a lot of, you know, F-16s and F-35s and F-22s that will help in the conduct of warfare or air power in the context or assuming that Israel would lose some of its air power. So. There's a different equation when it comes to the war with Lebanon, and it has to do with the rocket fire capabilities of Hezbollah that is much more advanced and much more uh, guided and much more precise and much more based on perhaps uh, some of uh, the more intricate and complex intelligence systems that it has. So that, that's a different uh, uh, pedigree altogether in terms of, of war fighting capabilities. But, you know, again, we can have we have seen it. We can read the history of resistance, perhaps even should, through just how you know the stone turned to the Molotov cocktail, the Molotov cocktail turned to the to the small explosive device, the small explosive device turned to, into a more intricate, complex, um, multi you know explosions. You know, it's always was the case that you know you had specifically with the case of Hamas and perhaps some of the other groups, the figure of the engineer as an important uh, part and parcel of uh you know the creation of techniques and technologies of resistance and how they're operated and combined within uh, uh, its own systems including you know from the human bomb uh, to the rockets and from you know the Yassines uh, that are adapted and invested by the the Palestinian resistance as a mean for anti-armored uh you know weapons um you can see it all over and i think it's it's important sometimes and i think that's what a lot of palestinians missed at least who haven't followed up a lot of the resistance in the in the past years because they were you know hopeless and they gave up hope is they didn't see that kind of development they didn't witness it and so that, that's why there's a surprise on 7th of october that you know the palestinians resistance. i mean we're all surprised but th there's a difference between being surprised that oh wow they have this capacity or uh oh wow this happened now you know and 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 i think for many palestinians intellectuals but also around the world they didn't you know they didn't understand how this could just erupt at a moment and for anybody tracing palestinian resistance from the first intifada to today they'll find that always palestinians find a way to create a new form of action a counter technique a counter technology 
a counter uh, device and that you know th there's an agility there and there's a sustainment of this capacity to resist over time throughout 134 years and that's why we're so still talking about palestine because Israel couldn't really uh, ever be decisive when it comes to its colonization of Palestine. Um, you know, the war have never ended on Palestine. That's why we're still talking about it. And that's why it's still an issue, at least at this historical moment. Yeah. Appreciate all of that analysis for sure. Um, there was one, there's one last question. Um, and folks, if you have questions, feel free to, to drop them in the chat too. We'll try to get to a couple. Um, but there was one question I had and, you know, you were on Intifada, Electronic Intifada. Folks, if you don't follow that, please do check out the live streams that they do. Um, it's really, I think, the best place to get, you know, multiple people analyzing, sharing um, what's going on, you know, on a on a very regular basis. I don't think it's quite every day, but it's usually every couple of days or so um, that they have a live stream. Um, but you were talking about the. Um, you know, the photo, the one photo ops that I guess we have seen out of uh, Israel in recent days that have, um, you know, any kind of, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't, as you said there, I don't think it was received the way that they intended it to be received, at least internationally. Um, and these are the photos of obviously, um, you know, Palestinian men that are stripped, um, that, you know, have these sort of photo opportunities of, of surrender, obviously. Um, you know, Israel has said, you know, look, these are all Hamas fighters who surrendered or whatever, which I don't think anybody with three brain cells actually agrees with um, or thinks is is possible. I mean, I say this with no offense because I'm a middle aged man with a dad bod myself. But, um, you know, these are not, you know, guys who are clearly like in the gym every day trying to figure out how to, you know, defeat their enemies in, in Mortal Kombat. Um, and again, I mean that in, in no offense, because I think part of what these video, these images are designed to do is to also, you know, humiliate these men, which is, you know, really obviously, um, you know, just kind of despicable. Um, but you do also talk about in that Intifada discussion um, about this, this operating in this realm of, you know, uh, the colonizer's desire of of Israel's desire um, to see images of surrender, to see images of men being emasculated, humiliated. Um, and, you know, again, I, you know, we can see this, I think, in relation to the kind of psychology that we've been talking about of the sniper, of um, these, these dominant systems. But even as they bomb, you know, do air campaigns or things like that, it doesn't fulfill any... I guess psychological um, payload of of kind of victory or of you know a, a direct military confrontation would have, and so yeah, I I don't know what else you would want to add to that or you know, but I, I've appreciated your kind of analysis of those, um, you know, those images. I mean, I mean, uh, look, Jared. I think for me, like for for us, I mean, Palestinian manhood is not something. Uh, that is generally discussed, you know, I mean, um, uh, especially on the left, because on the left, uh, we usually talk about our center, you know, the figure of, of, of the feminine or the woman. And we don't speak a lot about what it means to be a man under colonialism. You know? and, uh, and in many ways, um, there is that kind of orientalist racist trope that Israelis, you know, uh, produce and then they they believe, which is that you know rendering Palestinians naked humiliates them, and makes them feel ashamed, and it's one of these forms of uh, dominance and power that scares others, specifically if part of your targets in the north of the Strip is to clear the civilians, and to make sure that you're you know that no uh, Palestinians remain within the northern uh, Gaza Strip then you want to create these conditions where not only could you die or get killed, perhaps you're willing to get killed, but you're not willing to, you know, face, you know, this form of uh, humiliation and sexual abuse through being rendered naked or half naked and being paraded. 
So there's, it's an attack on Palestinian manhood meant to emasculate the Palestinian uh, man, especially after a moment in October 7th where Israeli manhood, at least, uh, specifically in the figure of its own fighters, were stamped on, stamped, stomped upon with the Palestinian fighters. You know, like we saw the pictures of soldiers being, you know, uh, under the boots of Palestinian uh, fighters. Uh, so there was this kind of injury to Israeli manhood that needs an address that needs somewhat some respite and this is where you know this kind of vengeance angle also is taking place at least in the context here but what I want to say is that in all interrogations of Palestinians there's a moment where you're uh, left naked for for a while you know in front of uh, an Israeli security guard so that form of policy is systematic and historical. It's not just the cause of fear. And it happens more under behind closed doors than it's actually showcased to the entire world. In a, in a way that every Palestinian going through the prison go through this, taking off his clothes, then being naked, being searched or strip searched, and then you know going through this process of being dressed with with clothes that are generally much bigger than him. No, it doesn't fill your body. It doesn't make you feel that you're clothed. You feel like you're holding something above you. It kind of prevents people from seeing your naked body, but it doesn't really uh, shelter you or, or otherwise. And that's part of like the interrogation techniques that Israel has used um, historically against the Palestinian people. So, I mean, you know, the, the idea of men and nakedness and shaming them through this Orientalist racist trope that Israel has devised is not new and I think for us when we saw the images uh, I mean pal many Palestinians can relate to it because they were left um, you know on the side half naked or they were left uh, strip search and you know some Israelis were trying to like say oh this is because they could have explosive weapons or devices you know I mean you can just do a, a check you know and people can put back their clothes on you know that's uh, even from that kind of point of view, it's it just it was meant as a as a as a, an image of humiliation, no? And it was meant as an image of humiliation that was disguised as Palestinian fighters surrendering. Now, are there some Palestinian fighters? Perhaps I'm I'm not sure, but you know maybe some Palestinian fighters were caught, they didn't have uh, any more firepower. Maybe some of them surrendered. Maybe there were some special operations that arrested some of them. But this type of mass arrest that Israel was attempting to sell to its own people for a long time did not happen. That now we're breaking Hamas. Now we'll see their fighters and brigades and doing, you know, a, a form of mass arrest. So there, there was also kind of this kind of accumulating frustration where, you know, you had to produce some sort of image that shows your own people that are starting, starting to doubt your own, uh, you know, uh, conduct and military operations and their successes, some sort of success. And this is why I think most of the Israeli propaganda is now just targeting its own society and its supporters. I don't think they're trying that much to convince any other people because what they're interested in at this moment is just to sustain the war. And to sustain the war, they just need to create this these images of victory, of success, of dominance, of vengeance that feeds into you know, a, a an eye that already is sympathetic to the Israeli army and wants to back it and wants to support it and wants to even go further. And that's why they're producing these kind of lousy form of propaganda um, also to its own society. That's the other audience that they're thinking of when they're, you know, producing that. Unfortunately, Jared, also like beyond the humiliation and demasculation of, of manhood and beyond that being also tied to a lot of practices of colonialism across the globe, historically speaking and fascism as well and also the na national socialist and you know I, I mean it's 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 a lot there's a long history of rendering people naked and also uh, uh, producing him in, in a way uh, disarmed you know um, helpless um, on on the trucks um, you know as if their bodies accumulating almost corpuses that cannot move you know um so there's all that imagery there i mean but also when they were actually in prisons now Haaretz reports in israeli newspaper that some of them were tortured and killed or died in prison i mean 
generally Palestinians die in prison you know, without you no know, anybody killing them. No, like it's uh, you know we just die here you know, out of nothing. Um, you know, but you know people were there because of the horrendous conditions, because of the torture, because of all of these things. I mean, it's it's one of these things where Israel is because they have been used for a long time. It's like you know when you bully somebody for a long time, but you're used to the world not seeing you bullying, you know. So you you practice that bullying, and then the world is looking at you and says like, oh what oh you're doing that, and now the Israelis are under the you know the scrutinizing lens of a lot of people from across the globe, but they only they wish and they desire to go back to that interrogation room where they can do whatever they want with us without anybody looking. But now once people are looking and, and noticing, they're noticing what being bullied by Israelis means, what being you know rendered a prison by Israelis mean, what being you know targeted by Israelis mean, and how that bullying generally takes place without much many people noticing except a couple of human rights organizations that write reports that nobody reads, no? Um, now you, there's, you're seeing it bare uh, in front of you um, in a way that people don't understand because as a bully, you're used to do these things without anybody holding you even accountable. And now social media and a lot of people are holding them accountable and ridiculing them and seeing through it. The other point, I mean, the last point I'll say is that it's true it's an attempt to emasculate Palestinian men. It's true that it's an attempt to humiliate the Palestinian male figure, to avenge um, the injury to the Israeli uh, fighter that happened on October 7th and that continues to happen until this day. But at the same time, most Palestinians saw through it in a sense that it didn't work. You know, the message didn't work. What they saw is a broken army Humiliated army has its uh, Gaza division destroyed in October 7th, is incapable of producing any military success even after two months of fighting within the Gaza Strip, or and I think now it's a month and a half of ground maneuver within the Gaza Strip. Um, attempting to produce propaganda videos and humiliating Palestinian men, but what you can see through that kind of, you know, hasty and lousy propaganda, it's on Israel's weakness and vulnerability. And I think a lot of people ridiculing, even among Palestinians, were ridiculing while being empathetic to the people that are being forced uh, to go through this form of humiliation. They were also ridiculing the Israel army that can't catch a fighter, but can humiliate you know, civilians and old men and journalists and doctors and other people that you know, a lot of people identified through the pictures of uh, of those who were arrested in, in in these mass arrest campaigns. Uh, a lot of them were released later on because they have no ties to whatever. And remember, when you know Israel says somebody has a tie to Hamas, it doesn't mean that they're Hamas. It's like you know, you don't know what the tie is. You know, like it's a flimsy, very large, uh, you know, a tie to Hamas. Maybe that you're cousin is Hamas and that you because of your cousin he's a cousin that you're tied to Hamas so that's a flimsy legal category it's not like you're a Hamas member or a fighter in the Qassam or a Nukhbe fighter or something like that it just simply means that we can find some sort of connection between you and 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 you know a Hamas member or somebody and you know remember Hamas is part of our society you know many people have Hamas people in their families many people have Hamas uh, you know uh, uh, work through the charity organ whatever it is you know you worked in the civil service you worked in the, the ministries so having a link to the governance body of your own you know uh, gaza strip is something flimsy like being a doctor means right that you're part of the governance apparatus so maybe that makes you link to hamas somewhat or some way or another so again i mean this lousy propaganda is revealing to me an israeli um uh weakness an israeli uh, a hastiness in terms of how it's producing its propaganda. In opposition, we see an actual effective propaganda by the Palestinian resistance that is actually working psychologically against the Israeli society, but also in, in, in garnering support among those who support it. And at the same time, in presenting itself as a fighting uh, uh, power that is still sustaining its own resistance and uh, inflicting pain on its own enemy. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it is hard not to sympathize or, um, I don't know, see as heroic an individual, a person 
who goes and blows up a tank you know i mean it just just visually right um the idea that you have these you know these massive you know structures of 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 war that are also kind of depersonalized because you don't see the tank operators and so on right and they're 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 coming through you know these people's neighborhood their their community etc and you see resistance fighters able to to destroy them i mean i it's hard not to i mean you know i don't know self critique maybe there's like some you know macho thing or whatever that i'm tapped into but you know i it, the reality is i i those videos i look every day i check them out you know every day i watch them and um like you say they're as as far as propaganda goes you know, meaning propaganda in the sense of just media that's intended to communicate something, which all media is. Um, I think that they're very effective. And I I have not, I mean, obviously, I have a sympathy with the Palestinian people, but, um, you know, I don't find any of the Israeli propaganda, you know, it, it mostly to me either seems, um, you know, just vile or kind of laughable at, at a certain time um you know and and yeah i mean we could go on a, that's a whole other topic that we could go down sometime yes. um but uh very much appreciate you taking the time today shout out to folks um for sticking around and watching this um i continue to enjoy following your work and um yeah thanks again thanks jared i'm happy to uh, be with you anytime right on all right, folks. So just a reminder again, Friday, um, we will have uh, the Kwesi Balagoon birthday celebration. Make sure to check that out. That's on the YouTube page already. And thanks again.